Welcome back, everyone, to part three of our look at the path to Pearl Harbor by Extra History. After we get through part four tomorrow, I will be taking a break from Extra History uh, so we can move on to some other content. You can be watching very soon for a video about upcoming content in the next couple of weeks and a look ahead to next year. So I'm excited about some of the things we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into this. There's a link in the description to the original content and also to my reaction to part one if you missed the first two episodes of this. Let's go ahead and dive in. Hanoi, September 22nd, 1940, 20 hundred hours. General Maurice Martin, commander of French forces in Indochina, sits in a humid meeting room with a general of the Imperial Japanese Army. So French Indochina, um, if you know where Vietnam is, Vietnam is a part of French Indochina. It's that part of Asia that the French have colonized. They're working under a deadline, for in two hours, Japan will invade. This had started in June, just after France fell, with a demand from Foreign Minister Matsuoka to cease shipments across the border to China and allow Japanese border observers. But as the months dragged on, the ultimatum has increased. Now, Japan wants the border totally closed and to station troops, ships, and warplanes in northern French Indochina. So this is interesting because uh, you don't really think too much or hear too much about what's happening with the French after they fall to Germany. Uh, so Germany invades in May 1940. France falls pretty quickly. They occupy a good chunk of France, but a big uh, part of it, especially the kind of the south, the central and southeast part of France, is under the Vichy government, which is a collaborate collaboration government. It's a it's a pro Germany government of the French, so that Germany doesn't have to waste manpower occupying the entire country. But France still has these colonies all over the place, which now, at least in theory, are under a government that should be pro German and therefore also pro Japan. But doesn't seem like that's the case. It's egregious, but Martin has little choice. The Japanese 22nd Army is ready to cross the border at 2,200 hours. He makes a counteroffer. How about 6,000 Japanese troops, not 25,000? The general agrees. Whew. An hour before the deadline, word goes out that an agreement has been reached. But when the deadline comes, the 22nd Army invades anyway. Thanks so much to Ground News for sponsoring today's historical tale. Japanese diplomats hadn't expected the Indochina operation to go like that. Theoretically, this was supposed to be part of a diplomatic expansion mm. south, one that was to be accomplished amicably through negotiation. And in theory, you would think that that would be a big deal for the Japanese, right? Because they've been at war for a couple of years now in the Pacific, uh, in Eastern Asia. Uh, so anything they can accomplish diplomatically and avoid being at war with another country or in, in, be able to avoid their troops having to get in, involved somewhere else, you're going to try to do that. After all, Japan was Germany's ally and Germany now controlled France. I mean, why wouldn't France just let them in? But again, at this point, Japanese diplomats weren't really running the show. Mm. Rather, militarists Military. in the cabinet were directing foreign policy now. And, even and we talked about that in the series we just did about Japanese militarism, right? Where uh, the, the civilian authorities in Japan really are not authorities at all. They're beholden to the military. And even within the military, you've got conflict between the army and the navy for influence and supremacy and to dictate what happens next. And the civilians are just, I mean, they're just basically powerless. And though Foreign Minister Matsuoka, a man who'd led Japan's exit from the League of Nations, was himself a militarist, even he still had limited power. The military considered the civilian foreign ministry unreliable and rarely shared their plans with Matsuoka or his subordinates. I mean, they'd sent a general to negotiate in Hanoi, not an ambassador. Meanwhile, low-level military officers were provoking conflicts again, like launching Poking a needless bear. invasion of French Indochina, despite receiving word of a diplomatic solution. And to be clear, we're not talking about a small border skirmish here. We're talking a multi-day undeclared war with tank formations and amphibious assaults. Now, a few months later, the foreign ministry did successfully act as a mediator to end a short war between Thailand and French Indochina, but that didn't really change. And so French Indochina, if you think of this being like kind of almost like a giant peninsula, French Indochina is the east, Thailand's on the west. Japan's image as a military aggressor and at the White House, Roosevelt most certainly still felt that way. 
Over that chaotic summer of 1940, he'd been taking all the actions he could, pitching them as defensive in order to avoid backlash from isolationists. In May, he'd stationed the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, where it could credibly threaten Japan should it try to move south. So if you're Roosevelt in this situation, Roosevelt has obviously, he's been talking to, you know, the British government, for example. The, Brit the Brits have been our allies going back to World War I um, and the French as well. And, and he knows, for example, Britain's standing alone in all of this. Roosevelt's been president for six years, six and a half years when World War II breaks out um, in 1939. But he knows that he's got an isolationist government at home. He you know, doesn't have the, uh, the political support to be able to get involved in the war directly. So he finds ways to get involved, right? you know, selling weapons and supplies and things like that to the allies, M positioning the fleet in Pearl Harbor, building things up, reinstituting the draft, things like that to kind of start helping get the U S on a footing to where it won't be completely caught off guard. If, and when we do end up at war, a move the Navy disliked since it split their fleet and kept it far from its home base. He'd also made diplomatic and congressional moves on what would eventually become the Lend-Lease program, which you can watch our video about here, supplying the UK and other not-quite allies with old military equipment. That's, yeah, uh, Lend-Lease. Again, just like in World War I, U.S. is technically militarily neutral, but not neutral in terms of the supplies and the help that is being given. And after the fall of France, he'd pushed a bill through Congress known as the Two Ocean Navy Act, expanding the U.S. Navy fleet size by 75%. Not only would this allow the U.S. to simultaneously fight a war in both the Atlantic and Pacific, the expansion focused on aircraft carriers and naval aviation, modernizing a badly aging fleet. And this is super important that this happens before the U.S. gets involved in World War II. Because these ships take years sometimes to build. It's not like you're pumping out a battleship in two weeks or an aircraft carrier. You've got to be planning ahead. And so the fact that the U.S. starts this ball rolling before getting involved in war is probably what saves us in the Pacific from what could have been a disaster. In September, he reinstated the military draft, and he began efforts to harden American defenses in the Philippines and Guam, and transform the civilian airstrips on Midway and Wake Islands into Navy air bases. America would not seek a war, the reasoning went, but given the march of German and Japanese aggression, it needed to be ready yep. to fight one. But after the aggression in Indochina, Roosevelt wanted to directly target the Japanese military. So he expanded the embargoes of the Export Act to also cover iron and steel scrap, metals crucial for war production. So think about this for a second, because, you know, we, we talk about alternate history sometimes, and I know some people don't like that. But the reason I do is because exploring alternate history allows us to take a, a kind of a micro look at certain events and their importance by kind of gaming out what would have happened if this decision or this event had gone a different way, thereby seeing how important it was. So, for example, we could say here, well, what if the military did listen and did stand down and did not send those 20-plus thousand troops into French Indochina? Does Roosevelt have the backing to expand these embargoes? And if he doesn't, and these embargoes don't happen, do we end up at war in December 1941? In response, the Japanese ambassador in Washington met with Secretary of State Cordell Hull, calling the metal embargo an unfriendly act. The United States was intervening in diplomatic negotiations between allies, he said, where it simply had no part. Besides, Japan was merely trying to stop illegal weapons shipments to the corrupt nationalist regime in China. But Hull knew that argument was a smokescreen because a U.S. military program known as MAGIC had secretly broken Japan's new diplomatic cipher, Purple. While the decryptions weren't total, and many of the messages were difficult to understand due to code words and poor translations, one thing was clear. The moves in Indochina were part of an expansion south. Never, ever, ever underestimate the importance, especially in World War II, of cryptography. Um of breaking codes and you know being able to uh, 
decrypt things, breaking codes, but also keeping the enemy from reading your codes. Time and time and time again, we see the importance of this, of using deception, but also breaking through the enemy's deception and understanding what he's doing. So, so important in this war. Yet relations did briefly improve. In November, that ambassador was recalled and replaced with the genial Admiral Namora, who immediately bonded with Roosevelt over their shared interest in naval matters. Yeah, remember, Roosevelt was once the assistant uh, secretary of the Navy. Furthermore, Hull and Namora got along well, meeting regularly at Hull's apartment, where they could be more candid, and Namura always kept an even temper, even when the two clashed, believing to his core that a conflict would be bad for both countries. But what Hull and even Namora didn't realize was exactly how much Roosevelt's attempt at deterrence was in fact driving Japan closer mm. to war with the United States. In Tokyo, military and civilian leaders were terrified over Roosevelt's expansion of naval power. Because this wasn't just the U.S. leaving behind the naval treaties of the 20s and 30s. Which everybody was doing by this point. This meant new American carriers, destroyers, cruisers, and airplanes coming off the production line every year for the next five years. Currently, the U.S. and Japan had roughly equal navies, with Japan having a slight advantage in merchant vessels. But now that America was on a war-producing footing, that might only last a year or two. So an argument started to circulate. If a war was inevitable, why not fight it soon? After all, every day Japan waited, the U.S. Navy was getting larger, and if Roosevelt cut their oil, the opposite would be true. Each day of non-combat operations would mean Japan had less fuel to fight. It's interesting how both world wars, the decisions of the nations that end up being the enemies of the United States, for example, uh, how some of the decisions they make that end up dooming themselves are in part because of the potential of the United States, not even the actual power of the United States. World War I, Germany launches this Kaiserschlacht offensive in the spring, the spring offensive of 1918, which basically destroys their ability to fight the war on the Western Front at that point because they know that every day the American army is getting bigger and bigger and eventually is become a, going to become a force on the Western Front in World War I. So it's not about the actual presence of the Americans, but the eventual presence of the Americans. Same thing here. Japan's looking at this and they're thinking, you know what, we can't win a long-term war against the United States, but the best chance we have is to hit them now before all of these new aircraft carriers and naval vessels come off the line and they get even more powerful. So we've got to hit them now and hope for the best. Japan's attempt to manufacture synthetic oil had failed, and when they made import deals with Mexico, the U.S. leaned on its southern neighbor to get those canceled. Foreign Minister Matsuoka, however, had a solution. Deter U.S. action by signing a tripartite pact with Europe's totalitarian states of Germany and Italy. Nazi diplomat von Ribbentrop had first suggested such a thing as early as 1938. And to Matsuoka, it made immediate sense. Germany was one of the few nations to recognize Japan's Manchurian puppet state. All three wanted to deter the U.S. from joining the war, and by signaling a mutual defense pact, it meant America would need to fight a two-ocean conflict. Germany also pledged that the Pacific would be Japan's sphere of influence, Matsuoka's concept of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. The idea that Japan would throw Western colonialists out of Asia and lead the region to prosperity. Though it should be noted, not everyone was on board with a Nazi alliance. In Tokyo, one colleague warned that Hitler was untrustworthy and routinely violated treaties. After all, Hitler had already broken his anti-communist pact with Japan by signing a yep. non-aggression pact with Stalin, and he hadn't even bothered to inform Tokyo in advance. Yeah, so, you know, it's important for us to recognize that when we talk about Japan and Germany, we can't talk about them the same way, for example, that we talk about England in the United States or, or the United Kingdom in, in the United States. They're not on that level of an alliance. They're not actively supporting and helping one another they're basically just saying the enemy of my enemy is my friend is what this is and they're still going to put their own interests ahead of everybody else including their so-called allies uh, it's very very different than what we see with the western allies an alliance hadn't helped them in indochina after all 
And once the pact was signed, Matsuoka had to issue embarrassing statements saying Japan wouldn't be adopting Germany's anti-Semitic policies. But Matsuoka remained committed to the alliance, especially because he believed the Soviets could be enticed to join, forming a bloc of totalitarian nations to challenge the Western democracies. Hmm. And in 1940, the alliance bore fruit. November 11th, 1940, 250 miles southwest of Sumatra. Officers of the German commerce raider Atlantis board the merchant vessel. They'd come upon it disguised as a fellow merchant ship, then fired at the bridge at close range, killing most of the command. Now they're taking passengers and crew aboard their own ship before scuttling it. But then, one of the passengers asks an officer if they could go get her family's tea set in the ship's vault. And when he agrees and goes to retrieve it, the officer finds more than just porcelain. 15 bags of top-secret mail destined for the British Far East Command. Oops. There are maps, decoders, intelligence reports, and a special bag filled with holes so it would sink when thrown overboard. Documents inside detail Britain's plans for the defense of Singapore, troop strengths in the region, and how the colonies would fight a potential war. The assessment is grim. Currently, Britain cannot win a fight with Japan. Hmm. All 15 bags were forwarded to Tokyo, their reception causing a massive stir. The Strike South plan was not only feasible, it should begin soon. But wait, what of the American fleet at Pearl Harbor? If Japan took... So here's another one of those moments, right? We were just talking about those moments history could have gone differently what if this lady doesn't say can i can you go back for my tea what if this guy doesn't find this stuff does this have that significant of an impact on japanese strategy in the pacific took the dutch east indies it would surely respond yet a group of naval officers felt otherwise arguing that the U.S. fleet could be preemptively destroyed at the commencement of hostilities, giving Japan a year or two to consolidate its wins in Southeast Asia before having to fight the Americans in earnest. It was worth developing a contingency plan. After all, in November, the British had used a fleet of carrier-launched torpedo bombers to raid an Italian port. Huh, they should get someone to study that possibility. Lucky for them, one man was eager for the assignment. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Yep. Oh, man, Zoe. Yamamoto, who went to Harvard, uh, and so he knew his opponents. He knew the Americans well. So I'm excited to dive back into this tomorrow with part four. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.